Lifting Up Jesus, Opening His Word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Let's begin with revisionism, then we'll look at hagiography, then we will look at myth. When I grew up, I always thought that what was done by European and Hispanic settlers in the New World, in both Latin America and in North America, to the indigenous people, that is the Indians, Native Americans, be it the Aztecs and Mayas in Mexico, or the Incas in Peru with Pizarro and Cortez in Mexico, or with the Spanish conquistadors in the American Southwest, Coronado de Soto, whoever, their followers, or what was done by the U.S. Cavalry in the Great Plains, what was done to the Seminoles and to the Creek Indians, the Walk of Tears under Andrew Jackson, I always thought these were terrible, terrible injustices. And indeed, they were terrible injustices. Relegating the indigenous people to reservations and land that was often not even applicable. It's a blemish on the history of America and on the countries of South America. It's indefensible. However, it is only half the truth. What I was never told in my left-wing orientation growing up was the other side of the coin. That before the Europeans came, there were incredible tribal wars between the indigenous peoples and among the indigenous peoples, scalping each other, massacres. I always thought the Sioux Indians was the name of a tribe. In fact, the name of the Sioux Indians that I associated with Eastern Montana and the Dakotas was actually the Lakota Indians, and they came from Minnesota. Their name was Lakota. It was the other tribes, like the Chickawa and the Blackfoot and the Crow, who called them Sioux, which meant invader. <laughs> they just invaded the lands of the other tribes in the Northern Plains and to the Black Hills and so forth of the Dakotas. What the Indians did to each other was no less atrocious than what the Europeans did to the Indians. I had this idea that it was some kind of a idyllic utopia before the Europeans came. But it wasn't. Man is fallen. If the Europeans didn't do it to the Indians, the Indians were quite capable of doing the same things to each other. Quite capable. My family is a mixture of Irish and Jewish. I have a Teuda Ole, an immigration certificate that says I'm a Jew, but my mother's an Irish Catholic. I was brought up by my mother and her family, but particularly my mother, believing in Irish republicanism, Irish nationalism. The English Protestants came and took our country, and they divided it into two countries. And I was told about the black and tans and the potato famine, and about Cromwell's plantations, about the terrible injustices perpetrated against the Irish. Again, these things are true. John Wesley, when he came to Ireland, said, if this is the way Protestants mistreat Catholics, it's no wonder that, that these Catholic people in Ireland don't want to get saved. It was true. But I was only told 
half the truth. The other half of the truth was inconvenient to tell me. The Irish were fighting each other, the Celtic tribes were fighting each other for centuries before any Anglo-Saxons came. But after Irish independence, after the Easter Uprising, there was a civil war in Ireland. Of the polypotentate, the pro-treaty and the anti-treaty Irish. These are Irish Catholics. What they did to each other was far worse, far worse than what the British did. It was the followers of Eamon de Valera, who was born in New York, the first Taoiseach or Prime Minister of Ireland. His followers assassinated Michael Collins, the founder and leader of the Irish Republican Army. I, did, I was never told this. On the Protestant side, it was even more ridiculous in a sense. I was always told about the Battle of the Boyne and King William of Orange, King Billy. His wife was a Catholic. The Pope supported him. There was a papal tardium in Vienna. They were celebrating his victory by ringing bells. There were Catholics who were fighting with William of Orange who were from Holland. It was not this simple Catholic Protestant thing, I'll defend we will maintain our Protestant throne and constitution. constitution. That's a half-truth. Not only that, but the first Irish uprising was not the one in 1690. It had begun before that. But there was another one after that in the 1790s. Napratandi and the people who came after Napratandi. So Isaac Both, later Charles Parnell, Wolf Tone. The author, Jonathan Swift, these Irish patriots, they were all Protestant who were organizing the Irish against the British crown demanding independence or at least home rule. I was never told that, that Irish republicanism was begun by Protestant. I was never told that. I was always told it was the orange-green Catholic Protestant. I was told a half-truth. A half-truth. This is revisionism. You only tell half the truth. The legacy of slavery in the United States is a disgrace. It's indeed a disgrace. But again, I was never told the whole truth. I was never told the whole truth. I thought colonialism, forced colonialism was wrong. I was always against colonialism unless the colonized wanted it democratically. Like, it's in the interest of, of Puerto Rico to remain American, and the people in Gibraltar want to be British, not Spanish, and so forth. As long as the people want it, it's one thing. If it's their democratic choice or discretion to remain colonized, that's not a problem. But forced colonialization, I was always against it. I was against the apartheid in South Africa. I thought it was racist and unjust, and it was. But those things are one half of the story. Look at Iraq. These countries in the Middle East, like Jordan and Iraq and so forth, they were created by the British and the French in the aftermath of World War I after the Ottoman Empire, who was aligned with the Kaiser, was defeated. These countries were artificially created. This kind of genocide you see in Syria and, and in Lebanon, when the French were in control, that didn't happen. In Iraq, this butchering of the Kurds and this war between the Sunnis and Shias, this didn't happen when Iraq was under European control. I don't agree with colonialism, but I see what happened without it. Africa? I spent a lot of time in Africa. We've had missions in Tanzania and Kenya. We have a work in South Africa. I've been to many African countries, the Swaziland, and I've been to Zimbabwe, and you know, I, I, I've, I've been to a number of these countries. <clears throat> Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya. I do not mean this in an imperialist way and certainly not in a racist way. Every single black African country I have been to was better off under the British in terms of social justice, standard of living, 
longevity, infant mortality, employment. Now, I don't like colonialism. My family and my background is from three people who fought the British. I'm an American, they fought the British for their independence. My family's Irish, they fought the British for their independence. My family are Israeli Jews, they fought the British for their independence. I don't like colonialism, and I didn't like imperialism. But I realize there's another side of the coin. Most of the infrastructure you see in Africa, everything, railroads, roads, universities, these things were built by the British or the French. The tribalism that has devoured Africa after the Europeans left is horrific. Terrible. What happened in Sierra Leone, what happened in Uganda under Idi Amin, what happened in the Central African Republic, what happened in Angola and Mozambique when the Portuguese left, these things were terrible. So there was half the story. Yes, colonialism was unjust and imperialistic and racist. But what the Africans did to each other was no better than what the Irish did to each other and no better than what the North American Indians did to each other, the Native Americans. Man is fallen. Again, I was against the apartheid. I would never speak in a segregated church in South Africa. But since the end of apartheid, black unemployment has more than doubled. The crime has become insufferable. The biggest victims being blacks, although many whites have been killed also. The middle class is driven out of the country. The professional and business classes have been eroded, leaving the country without adequate professionally qualified people to run the economy and the technical aspects of the infrastructure. What happened in Zimbabwe, an affluent country where there was no apartheid, after Mugabe got in control of it, it was horrible. The black people there were much better off. Now again, I just say to South Africa, wasn't apartheid bad enough? But what they have now is worse. Unemployment, infant mortality, longevity reduced among blacks and the crime, it's the corruption. It's a nation that's exchanged one evil for another. Oh, end apartheid. Yeah, I agree, it was bad. End colonialism. I agree it was bad. What we did to the Indians. I agree it was bad. Oh, what happened to the Irish? I agree it was bad. But it's only one half of the story. They only tell you the half they want you to hear. What makes good propaganda? What makes good copy? What's expedient, politically expedient for the powers that be? Now, I accept that the world is like that. But the church should not be like that. Yet it is. So we go from revisionism, rewriting history, to its natural bedfellow, hagiography. All the reformers, they were great people. The Great Reformation. <coughs> Yeah. John Calvin's police state in Geneva burning people alive in the name of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, the peasants revolt. The peasants should be stabbed in the back. His dear tribes against the Jews, his sermons. We, we the German nation are to blame, for we do not kill the Jews to prove we are Christians, quoted extensively by Hitler in Mein Kampf. And what came later out of the Reformation? Cromwell's Puritans, witch hunts, the English Puritan Calvinists and the Scottish Presbyterian Calvinists, both of them Reformed Calvinists, massacring each other in the name of Jesus Christ. Not to mention what was done to the Irish. That was exported to Salem, Massachusetts with the witch hunts. Now, don't get me wrong. I recognize the reformers were right about sola scriptura, only scripture. Sola gratia, only grace. Sola fide, only faith. I realize that they were right about the corruption of the medieval papacy. I realize they were right. 
about the authority of Scripture against tradition. But look what they did. They're like the Church of Sardis, having a name for being alive but are dead. They simply replaced a Catholic state church with a Protestant one. Mainstream Protestantism continued sprinkling the babies, a completely unscriptural practice that created nominalism and told people they were Christians when they weren't. Then you have to go tell the people they need to be saved after you've, you've told them they are Christians? Dia it's just a diabolical mess. I told the half about the Reformation. Oh, the great Reformation! Oh, the great Reformers! Oh, it's wonderful! Oh, beloved Luther, the Lutherans call him. Beloved Luther? A man who preached murder? Now, Luther began right. He began right. There's no question. Martin Luther began right. But there's no question, like King Joash in the Old Testament, he ended rather badly. I'm not his judge, but I judge what he did and what he said and what he wrote. He began right and ended bad. So we go from revisionism to hagiography. Then we go to myth, where people are mythologized. But let's look at the differences, first of all, before we proceed to myth. The differences between scripture, scriptural history, biblical history, and revisionism. The differences between scriptural biography and hagiography. I look at the heroes of the 1960s and the 1950s and things like this, the Crusaders for Justice, going back, say, to Abraham Lincoln in the 19th century. He's the great emancipator! He was. But I was never really told there were seances in the White House, nor was I told that when he was president, he didn't liberate all the slaves, only the, one that, only the ones under Confederate governments, that the U.S. Capitol Dome in Washington, D.C., under his presidency, was built by black slaves. He was a corporate man. He worked for industrial interests. The plight of Irish labor and of Chinese labor in the West was in many ways as worse and certainly no better than that of black slaves in the South. Oh, the black slaves in the South, what was done to them? That is true. It is also true that those people were already slaves in Africa with Afro-Islamic tribal chieftains who sold them. They were already slaves in Africa. It's not that the white man came and took them as slaves. They were sold into slavery, or they had already been slaves, sold by their own kind. I was told half the truth. Revisionism. Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator. Abraham Lincoln suspended the right of habeas corpus. He imprisoned people without trial. He imprisoned journalists and newspaper editors for being critical of his policies and handling the war. Just put them in jail, no trial. Yeah, we make him into a liberator. Well, I was told half the truth about Abraham Lincoln. I don't think anybody who read the whole truth would deny that had he not been assassinated, he would not be remembered by history as fondly as he is. Many would say the same is true of JFK. We remember his good points, but we downplay his bad ones because he was assassinated. Well, let's go further. Oh, one of my childhood heroes, one of my teenage heroes, John Lennon. Imagine there's no heaven. I met, kind of knew his first wife, Cynthia. The way that man treated his family, the way he treated his son, Julian, and his wife. It, it. Imagine no possessions. He lived in the Dakota. He lived in, the, he lived in an opulence beyond belief. He had a mansion near where, I live, where I'm now. 25 minutes or 20 or 25 minutes from where I'm seated right now was John Lennon's estate at Ascot. You wouldn't believe the opulence and extravagance. Imagine there's no heaven. Imagine no possessions. <laughs> he would have found it very hard to imagine no possessions. What's this contradiction? I was told half the truth. 
it's hagiographic. He was shot so he's remembered as a greater hero than he actually was, even though I have no question as to his talent. It doesn't matter. John Lennon, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King. There's a lot of good things to be said about Martin Luther King and a lot of things I like about him. I think he was the greatest orator in the English-speaking world of the 20th century. There's also no doubt that he was sexually immoral. Th that he was into orgies and things like this. This is not gossip. It's proven. It's known. It's, it's also documented that he was a plagiarist. You can't say that about Abraham Lincoln, you can't say that about Martin Luther King. Mahatma Gandhi's another one. He supported the caste system. It is a system of social injustice uglier than the caste system. I don't know what it is, and I don't want to know. At least in the Judeo-Christian world, people have the idea that racism was wrong. The caste system is based on Originally, your complexion, how white your skin was, the higher you were in the caste, you were a Brahmin. Then there were the outcasts, the Dalit, and it went by complexion. It is utterly racist, and it's not even seen as a problem. It's seen as your karma. The Dalai Lama is another one. The persecution of Christians in Tibet was unspeakable. What the Tibetan Buddhists have done to Christians? The lack of religious freedom in those places where it exists, like Nepal? Bhutan? Oh, the Dalai Lama is the leader of a people who've been victimized by China. That's half the truth. We're told half the truth about John Lennon. We're told half the truth about the Dalai Lama. We're told half the truth about Martin Luther King. We're told half the truth about Abraham Lincoln. The fact is they were like us, a combination of good and bad. Slavery. We're told half the truth. It wasn't that the white people came and took these people slaves. They were slaves. Not only that, but a black slave had a capital value. It was worth money. The real dangerous jobs, like blasting the passes for the railroads in the West, they used the Chinese for that. They had no capital value. A black slave was worth money. You could sell them. The coal mining in Pennsylvania, black lung disease. This was the Irish. They had no capital value. A slave was worth more than an Irishman. A black slave had a cash value. An Irishman did not. <coughs> I was never told this. It was always the blacks are the victims, the Irish are the victims, the Indians are the victims. Revisionism. Hagiography. Where do the scriptures differ? Where does the word of God tell us something different? The Judeo-Christian scriptures are not revisionist. They tell us Israel's sin as a nation. It shows us how they were the victims of the Canaanites and of the Egyptians. It shows us how they were the victims of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. It shows us how they were the victims of the Philistines and the Amalekites. It shows us how the Israelites, the Hebrews, were the victims. But it tells the whole story of the King Manasseh, the massive human sacrifice of infant babies to Molech, the atrocities of what happened with the tribe of Benjamin in the book of Judges, the unspeakable sins that took place under Jeroboam the first and Jeroboam the second. The sins of Israel became so bad that God said even the pagan nations wouldn't do these things that you as my people who have my word are doing. In the New Testament, this continues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is one example. Paul says concerning sexual immorality that involved an incestuous relationship. Even the pagans wouldn't do this. Unbelievable. No, there's the difference. History as recorded in Scripture is not revisionist. It tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
It told how God's people were the victims. But it also told how they were the victims of themselves, their own kind, their own leaders, and their own sin. Revisionism is for the world. It's for secular historians to rewrite history. God's history is not revisionist. Not even in the least. Neither is it hagiographic. When we look at the book of Kings, remembering that Chronicles gives more of a historical perspective of Israel's history, while Kings gives more of a biographical perspective, it tells us not only of the virtues of the leaders, but of their flaws. Even good kings like Hezekiah and Asa, as well as the bad ones. We see the recorded sins of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It shows their flaws. The idea being, if our forefathers were like that, we're no better. But if God forgave them and loved them and blessed them anyway, he can do the same for us if we repent and trust him by faith. It shows the mistakes of people like Peter. It shows the mistakes of people like Moses. It shows King David's courage and virtue, and it shows his reprehensible behavior. He actually had an innocent man killed so he could take his wife. God's history is not revisionist, and God's biography is not hagiographic. Let the world lie. The world will only tell us half the truth about Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Abraham Lincoln. God tells us the whole truth about our forefathers and about ourselves. The world will always tell you the story of the victim, but it won't tell you how the victim is co-equally capable of becoming the victimizer. But God's word does. Let the world lie. God's word is truth. And so we have revisionism. We have hagiography. But then we have myth. Look with me, please, to Colossians chapter 2. Remember as we point out whenever we turn to Colossians, that essentially Colossae, Laodicea, <coughs> and Heropolis, Colossae, Laodicea, and Heropolis were all within a few miles of each other, walking distance. They were basically one extended church, one extended Christian community. And we read the following in chapter 2 of Colossians. I'll begin in verse 16. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink in respect to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to the Messiah, that is Christ. But then it says in verse 18, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. When people take a doctrinal stand based on angelic revelation, they have departed from under the headship of Christ. Whenever you see God using an angelic messenger, they always point to the Lord. When Daniel fell before the angel, when John fell before the angel, the angels would, would, would tell the people of God, don't pay any homage to us. Don't pay any obeisance to us. It's the Lord. We're just messengers. 
one cult after another and one false religion after another has mythologized leaders claiming angelic revelation as their basis. This is, of course, uh, prolific in Roman Catholicism. But putting Roman Catholicism, with which most of us are familiar, aside, let's begin with Islam. Muhammad, according to Islamic writings, claims that he received the Koran from the angel Gabriel. Now, he was not sure if it was Gabriel. He didn't know if it was true or false, but he was told by his first wife it was Gabriel. And so that, that was the basis of it. He himself was an illiterate man. Now, let's understand this further. Muhammad becomes not simply hagiographic. Muhammad, again, at the age of approximately 54, took Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakir, when she was six and married her, and took her virginity at the age of nine. According to the Hadith, according to the teachings of Islam, Muhammad was a pedophile. It's the teaching of the Hadith. I'm not calling him a pedophile. I'm just quoting from their own literature. After Muhammad compelled his son to divorce his wife, Muhammad took his stepson's wife as his own. According to the Islamic scriptures, their God Allah was not pleased and told Muhammad to take no more wives. But he did. He continued to take wives, even though his Allah supposedly told him not to, after he forced his son to divorce his wife so he could have her. Now notice something. First he becomes hagiographicized. You can't say anything about Muhammad, though. But these are in your own scriptures. I'm only saying what your own scriptures say about him. That's all skirted over in other scriptures and other commentaries. But then he becomes mythologized. He was an illiterate man. He claims to have gotten these revelations from Gabriel with no proof. Where did God ever give his word to an angel? We have a historical account of Gabriel appearing to Mary. But he was only fulfilling what had been predicted in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin shall conceive, and it was the apostles who wrote the account in the Magnificat. In the book of Revelation, the angels are messengers, but it was Jesus who dictated the letters, not the angels. Yet Islam depends on the very thing that Colossians 2 says to look out for taking a stand on a vision of angels, resulting in self-abasement and resulting from not being under, and the consequence being that they're obviously not under the headship of Christ, or at least that's what it indicates. Let's go further. Joseph Smith, Mormonism, same thing. Although there are conflicting accounts, he claims this angel Moroni appeared to him. Well, what does Joseph Smith do after this claimed vision? He does the same thing Mohammed did, taking multiple women. Bigamy, polygamy. Follows the same pattern as Mohammed. Let's go further. Ellen G. White claims the vision of an angel founds the Seventh-day Adventists in the aftermath of the Millerite fiasco, 19th century. Remember, every single follower of David Cordish at the Branch Davidian cult was a Seventh-day Adventist. Same thing, taking a stand on the vision of angels, then Cordish says he's this angelic being. 
in the book of Revelation, and people's survival depends on their association with and loyalty to him, to the point where they shot it out with the FBI and were willing to die. But what was he into? He was sleeping with other men's wives, not allowing them to sleep with their own wives, and taking their underage children. He was a pedophile and a serial adulterer. He had a harem. Same as Joseph Smith, same as Muhammad. They all became sexually immoral, even perverse. Based on some angelic vision, they gave them this power, leverage over people, and look what they did with the power. Self-abasement! Then we have the Jehovah's Witnesses. After the prediction that Christ would return in 1914 failed to happen, they said he had turned his attention to the affairs of earth, and then Jesus came, who he really is, invisibly, as the angel Michael. This is what they teach. And he came not to Jerusalem as the book of Zechariah says, or as the book of Revelation says, or anything of this nature. He comes to Brooklyn. <laughs> Jesus returned to Brooklyn and to New York in the person of the Archangel Michael. That was what happened in the early Jehovah's Witnesses. Up until the 1970s, they claim that they are supported and guided by angelic agency, that they operate under angelic guidance. Franz, from their governing committee, at the trial in Scotland, in which he testified, said this under oath. Angels. <laughs> no. Michael the Archangel is not Jesus Christ, and he didn't walk into the Jehovah's Witnesses' offices in Brooklyn. <coughs> invisibly. No angel named Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith. Gabriel did not appear to Mohammed. And no angel appeared to Ellen G. White. And no David Kordash was not an angel. We go from hagiography to myth. You rewrite history, you rewrite biography, and then you mythologize someone to try to give them Christ counterfeiting attributes. Well, the worst is yet to come. History is being rewritten as we speak by Christians. Hey, geography is taking place as we speak, and so is mythologizing of heretics. William Branham claimed seven angels came to him, gave him a revelation. He wouldn't preach in a church unless these angels showed up, he said. He said denominations, uh, denominations is the mark of the beast, not that I'm a denominationalist, but they would all come to the World Council of Churches by 1977. He prophesied falsely. And he prophesied, the trinity is of the devil, thus saith the Lord. This is Branham. Where did he get it? His angels. William Branham, Joseph Smith, Mohammed, David Koresh, Ellen G. White, Charles Tazzy Russell and Judge Rutherford, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Muslims, take your pick. So you go from revisionism to hagiography. But when those things get into the church, we got a problem. Let the secular biographers and the secular historians lie. Let them portray a reality that's not true or not accurate. They only show the good sides of the people they like and put a spin on the bad side. They rewrite the history to suit the propaganda. Let the world do it, but once the church does it, we are in trouble. But the church is doing it. Not only revisionism, 
people are writing about things like what happened with Branham and then Kenyon as if they were positive. These were bad things. They're even writing about the Toronto deception as if it was a revival. It's, it's, it's false. There's the revisionism. That is the hagiography. But now there's even mythologizing. Well, somebody is going to come. He's going to have history rewritten for him. He's going to be completely hagiographic in the way he's portrayed. And he's going to be mythologized in his lifetime. This will be the Antichrist in company with the false prophet. The worst is yet to come. But the best is also yet to come. Let the world write its lies, its revisionism, its hagiography, even its mythologization. Let the apostate church do the same. But in Scripture, God does not do that. For those who delight in believing the half-truth, for those who delight in embracing the lie, the worst is yet to come. For those who embrace the truth of Christ on the basis of the Word of God, although the worst is yet to come, so is the best. Jesus is coming again. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.